As we've, as we've been in this service day, I'm just reminded that you know, the, the Spirit of God is in this place and He's, He's stirring us, He's moving us to worship. Maybe you've, you've felt His presence in your heart already and now is the time where we're about to read His Word together. I just felt compelled to give this warning of if you don't feel like dealing with Him today, if you don't feel like Him speaking to you today, Now's your chance to escape because he's in this place and he is dealing with hearts. He could be encouraging you. He could be convicting you. He could just be saying, I'm here and I love you. He's saying something to you, so be warned. The, the word of the Lord is about to be read. Amen? Amen. Y'all just please stand with me. From Hebrews chapter 10... Verses 21 through 23, the word of the Lord says, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with sincere heart and in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to our hearts, or that you cleanse our hearts, that you give us a clear conscience before you. And I just pray that today you would have your way in our lives, that you would speak what we need to hear, and then our hearts would hear it clearly. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. The children may be released if they have not been already. Amen. You know, I was thinking, one of the things I've always appreciated is that cause and effect relationship. It always comforts me that when there's a cause, there's an effect. That just makes me happy. I can't really explain it to you. There's something so comforting about knowing that when this happens, this follows. You know what I'm saying? Like, L Lucy's now two. Lucy disobeys. Cause, effect, she gets a warning. Lucy disobeys the warning, cause, effect, Lucy's disciplined. It, that, it just makes so much sense. We, we live in a world full of cause and effect. Some, some of them may be so small we don't even really acknowledge them. Some of them are, are a huge difference. Um, cause, you didn't pay your power bill this month. Effect, it's dark. <laughs> Cause, you had children. Effect, your house is always dirty and your accounts are always empty. It could be something simple. Cause, you've been to work recently. Effect, you got paid. One that hits particularly home for me as of yesterday. You wash your sheets. Cause, effect, you just sleep better that night, don't you? We live in a world of so many causes, and it's always just comforted me. Because now I know what to expect. If I do something, there's a reaction that I can expect to come my way. That helps me. I know if I commit armed robbery, I go to prison. I don't want to go to prison, so I don't commit armed robbery. It helps. <laughs> Cause and effect is a beautiful thing. Look at the cause and effect in the passage that we just read this morning. Because since we have a great priest over the house of God, that's our cause. What is the effect? You can draw near to God with full assurance. Because of who Jesus is and because of what Jesus has caused, the effect on all of us who believe in Him is that we can draw near to God with a clean heart and with a pure body, and we can know for certain that He will not turn us away. Here, here then, because of who Jesus is and because of what He has done, the effect is you can draw near to Almighty, Holy, Creator, Sustainer, God. 
And you can do it knowing that your heart is clean. Your body is pure. Your conscience can be clear. And He will not reject you. Something that I think that we, not just as New Hope as a church, but the church as a whole, something we have to, we have to start doing better is explaining why this is true. Because a fair question to that statement I made would be, how can you know for certain that God won't turn away from me? How can you be so sure that He will not reject me? I know me. I would reject me. It's a fair, it's a fair question, isn't it? And if you ignore that kind of question, we don't explain why He won't reject you, why He won't turn away. We do them a disservice because they'll think, well, He doesn't turn away from some people, but He does turn away from me. Even if they assumed with us that God is real, there are some people, even in this very city, who don't believe He's real. Even if for a second they assumed He was real, why would He want to deal with them? Why does He want to deal with you? To answer these questions, I want us this morning to look at, at two pieces of Scripture together. One, we are going to look at Hebrews 10. So if you have your Bibles open to it, mark it. We'll come back to it. But the story I want us to really look at this morning starts all the way back in Genesis, in chapter 28, where we encounter Jacob. Now, Jacob, he is a very important man in the Bible. This is why throughout the Old Testament and places in the New Testament, you see God references he is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That's an important fella. He's remembered on and on. Why is Jacob so significant? We talked about his life a, a few weeks ago in Sunday school. We kind of looked at it. We're looking at a different angle, so if you're in there, pay attention still. This is different, but the same. Jacob is a promised child. Uh, before this, God calls Abraham. He says, one of the promises he gives, your descendants will be as large. If you could count the stars, that's how many you would have. And when Abraham is an old man, he, is, he has the son promised him, Isaac. And as Isaac gets older, God speaks to him and says, your descendants will outnumber the sand along the seashore. Seashore. Ugh. That was a rough one. And Isaac has two sons. Esau is his oldest, and his twin brother, just a few seconds younger, holding him by the heel, Jacob. We learn early on that Jacob is a very deceptive man. When we come to Genesis 28, he has just stolen his brother's blessing. By deceiving his own father... Not a nice man. You wonder, how is this man listed as the God of Abraham and Isaac? How is his name in there? Well, in Genesis 28, we have this story where Jacob, he's, have to leave, he's had to leave home. Esau found out. He stole my blessing. As only fair, I have to kill him. A justified reaction? Not really. Esau was just an angry, bitter man. But Jacob's mom heard, and because Jacob was her favorite, she sends Jacob to live with her brother. And while he's on his way, he has an encounter with God. And this is what happens when we read, starting in verse 10, excuse me, verse 11. And Jacob came to a certain place, and he stayed there that night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones of that place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep. Pause there for a second. Don't you ever complain about your pillow again. <laughs> Continue. And he dreamed. And behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth, and the top reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending upon the earth. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you. 
and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Jacob's not a nice man. And yet the Lord speaks to him. What an amazing promise. I mentioned earlier, I love cause and effects. They comfort me. But every now and then we know that there's an anomaly in the force somewhere where we don't get the effect we thought was going to occur. And that's what we get here. If you, can you imagine if, you, if God spoke to you like that? Would you shout with praise or would you just like fall to the ground in humility like, why, how, why me? Would you dance or would you just be like too awestruck to move? It's kind of like, what, what do I do with this? Jacob doesn't have the response, I thought. The effect did not match the cause. He almost seems to, to not believe it and put God to the test. Because he says, you know what? God, I'll buy it. If you, if you say you'll, if you go with me, if you make sure I'm fed and that I'm clothed, and you can bring me back to my family in peace, then you can be my God. That's not, the, that's not the response that you would imagine someone having to the Lord. And what will unfold is Jacob's life because where he's at, when he wakes up, he takes that rock pillow he had, he makes an altar, he says, this must be God's house. So he calls it Bethel. And he leaves, and then over a span of seven chapters, we have Jacob's entire life, and it is anything but peaceful. He goes to see his uncle Laban. He falls in love with Laban's daughter Rachel, and he says, I want to marry her. Laban says, you can marry her for seven years of service to me. And the Bible says in one of those romantic verses, those seven years seemed but a few days to Jacob because of the love that he had for her. Mm -mm. Anyway... But Jacob is tricked. Because as the wedding ceremony, they would celebrate that day, Jacob would go into what would be the home for his family. We don't live in a time of electricity. It's dark. Rachel was supposed to be sent in. They would consummate the marriage, and when they would wake up, their husband and wife. But lo and behold, when he wakes up, it's not Rachel, but Leah, her older sister. Even when you read it, they put an exclamation point. Behold, it was Leah. Like, <laughs> he wakes up and he's a little upset. What is it you've done? I worked seven years for Rachel. Why do I have her? It's not right for the younger to be married before the older. She would have been ashamed. I had to do it. Tell you what, you can have Rachel for seven more years of service. Please note, it doesn't say those seven years felt like a few days. <laughs> what unfolds while he's there? Not only does now Jacob have two wives, but these wives are sisters. So they compete for the love of the earth. And what better competition to have than who can give him the most children? At the end of this said feud, Jacob not only has two wives, but four baby mamas because they each give their servant to try and one-up the other one. So he has four women, 12 sons, and a daughter. Now also, in the span of it, God is blessing him. He has accumulated not only a large family, which is a very big prideful thing in that day. The size of your family, especially the number of your sons, is a sign of blessing. So he is blessed to have his 12 Sons, He's, He grows in wealth as far as his flocks and his herd goes. He accumulates some wealth. And the time comes, he says, it's time for me to go home. But even going home is not easy because Rachel steals some of the false gods of her father. She hides them, so Laban tracks him down. Laban tried to steal all of his sheep and his goats back. But Fascinating story, but go read it. It's not for today. So he finally has separated from Laban. He's on his way home, and then he remembers, 
Esau's at home. Things did not end on the best terms. I'll send someone to head to tell him, guess who's coming home? Your brother. Woo! The guy comes back saying, your brother Esau's going to meet you. He's got 400 men with him. Oh, gosh. Jacob's terrified. He's an old man now. So he splits his camp in half. Leah with the children he has with her and her son. Rachel and the two sons he has with her and their servants to this side. He divides his flock so if they get captured, maybe one of them can get away. And to top it all off, before this man's story is over in our seven chapters, he has a wrestling match with God. Can you just imagine? The way we read it, it's so weird. Jacob is in his tent alone. He has to meet Esau tomorrow. And a man comes in and starts wrestling him. Not even hello. Just jumps on him. And this isn't a quick match. They wrestle all out. The sun is about to break. And because Jacob just won't go down, with just a touch of a finger, his hip is knocked out of place. And as a result, Jacob has a lifelong limp and a new name. He is now Israel. Which means, I contend with God. I wrestled with God. He meets Esau. They actually have a nice reunion. Esau's not mad. The 400 men are there for Jacob's protection, as it turns out. He falls on him, and they cry, and they, it's, it's a beautiful reunion. He says, come live with me. And Jacob's like, I got a lot of stuff. I'll sit here, but I'm glad we're cool. And after seven chapters and an entire life, we read this when we come to Genesis 35. Starting with verse 1, God said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel, and live there. Remember Bethel, where he slept on a rock, and he dreamed of a ladder that reached up to heaven, and where God said, I will give you this land. Your descendants will outnumber the dust of the earth. You will bless all the families of the world. And Jacob names the place Bethel, the house of God. Arise, go up to Bethel. Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob, hear the response of this man now. Remember, I, I told you the, his reaction. The effect was not what I thought would be caused seven chapters ago. But listen to this man now. Jacob said to his household and to all who were with them, Put away the foreign gods that are among you, and purify yourselves, and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel, so that I may make there an altar to the God who answers me in the day of my distress, and has been with me wherever I have gone. Jacob is a transformed man. What caused such a transformation in him? It was the promises and the presence of God in his life. And to ask it a different way to kind of go along with the words I've been using, what is the effect of God's presence and God's promises on a life? It's transformation. You see, when a person challenges this belief that they could stand before God pure and clean, as Hebrews 10 showed us, we can point them to a God who is patient, to a God who is long-suffering, to a God who knows you. We can all relate to doubting God's grace, can't we? Especially since we became believers, right? Because it seems like then our, our, our sins and our failures, they magnified all of a sudden. Because I thought that once I asked Jesus into my heart, everything was supposed to go well. So either Jesus doesn't work or I don't work with Jesus because I can't get this right. 
does it mean that I'm too sinful to be a Christian? Because I don't, I don't see what's happening in me that Jesus is even worth it. The Bible reveals to us a God who knew we would be a mess. He knew that you would fail. And He knew you would make mistakes. He knew you would have struggles that would last every day of your life on this earth. Yet He loved you still and was willing to send His Son to die. When we return to Hebrews 10, and if you look at the order of that chapter, we see, we see the fullness of God's love and His grace on display. Because when you start Hebrews 10, the author is talking about how only Jesus is enough. You see, because God gave His people, Israel, He gave them the law, and the law gave them the rules and the procedures on how to have their sins forgiven. It told them what type of animal to bring, how to go about sacrificing it, what to do with sprinkling the blood on the altar, the priest doing this for you, and what your responsibilities were, so your sins would be forgiven. But we see that it had to be done yearly. And strangely enough, we sometimes, some of us talk about this over Wednesday night dinner, animal sacrifices. That's what you're missing if you don't come, by the way. This was a very costly thing they had to do. Because you couldn't just bring any animal. You had to bring your best one. You bring your best bull to the sacrifice. That's a costly thing. Whenever your strongest, healthiest one pulled your plow to earn your food, like now you have to get rid to, to have your sins free. It cost you something. If you were bringing a, a lamb, it had to be pure and spotless. It had to be male. It couldn't... That's going to lower you raising your flocks. How are you going to recover from that? But it had to be done yearly. Because as we see at the start of Hebrews chapter 10, otherwise, in verse 2, they would have stopped offering them if once was good enough. And as he goes on, he says, but Jesus came and he only had to die once. That was it. And that... Let that sit and, and, and ask those, ch challenge those questions that, that 21 through 23 bring up. That you can come before God with clean hands and a pure heart and a conscience that is clear. Because a part of us that says, I would rather offer a yearly because that way I at least know that year's been covered. Because if I, if I don't do well for 2018, on January 1st, 2019, I can offer it. And I got a clean start on the year. And the Bible, God tells us no. Because with me and through my son, the effect is that you are forgiven. You are cleansed. Now when you come to me, your hands, they are clean. Your conscience, it can be clear. Your heart is pure. Believe me. Jesus, He does away with those first ones. It's actually verses 9 through 10, if you want to read it with me. He does away with the first sacrifices in order to establish the second. And by that will, we have been sanctified. We've been made holy. We've been made clean and pure through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Once for all. We see the massive cause and effect again because of who Jesus is. He is the Son of God. And because of what He did, coming to be just like us, to be tempted every way that we're tempted, but remaining perfect. And He's not killed for that. He lays down His life. He says, they can't take it away from me, but I lay it down for you. 
And because I lay it down, all of your sins, they are covered. But you might say to me, Larkin, my heart doesn't feel pure. My hands don't feel clean. Why don't I think and feel like this is true? And I'll just tell you that his death was enough. It was enough. Why don't I feel it? It takes a while to feel it sometimes. Is there anything worse than whenever you come to God and you ask for forgiveness and you have that lingering thought in your head, what if I do this again? Anyone else? Just me? Right on. It's okay. Well, just me then. I used to really wrestle with that. God, I want to repent, but what if I mess this up again? I don't want to take advantage of you. Right? We don't want to take advantage of God. He's saying your sins can be forgiven, but I, I, don't, I don't want to keep asking you for it. I don't want to make you keep forgiving over and over and over. We've said it before. I, I felt like sometimes I even had to wait a few days before I could come to and ask forgiveness because as if God was going to say, I need time. <laughs> Just give, give me a day. That's not what he says, is it? That's not the God that he tells us that he is. He says, like we say, he says, come to the altar. And I say, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. I'm prone to leave the God I love. But he to rescue you from all your sinfulness. Cover them with the blood of his son. This is a God who loves you. But isn't it strange how, looking at Jacob, isn't it strange how, how bold most of us are before we surrender our lives to God? And once we commit to it, we shrink back from Him. Before you commit to God, you're like, okay, God, like Jacob, if you are a God, then you can do that, and then I'll believe you. And what does He do? He does that. And you believe, and all of a sudden you're like, well, I shouldn't do that anymore. What I was wanting to get across to us this morning, as we look at the life of Jacob, as we look at the cause and effect of what Hebrews tells us, because we have a great high priest who's over the house of God, come with assurance to God, with certainty, that he doesn't look on you when you make a request and say, hmm, I saw you this past week, though. Don't we have some sins to address first before I can do that? I don't think you've mourned enough yet for me to answer you. That's not, that's not what our God says. He says that through His Son, your hands are clean, your heart is pure. Bring it on. Ask me. What if instead of shrinking back from once we became believers, we were more bold about it? What if you actually believe that challenge I said at the beginning that I heard Sherrod say? What if before you opened and read during the day, you went, God's Word does some stuff. I need to be careful when I open this. <laughs> what if he actually heard these prayers up here at the cross? Do you... Have you realized the ones who give testimonies seem to be the same ones weekly? Because at one time, there was this little bit of a challenge to it. God, I know if you can do this, and he's almost like, if, watch me. I love that story of the man who comes to Jesus in the Gospels. He says, if you could just do something. He's like, something? I'll do more than something. I'll do what you asked and then some. What if we as a church were more bold like that? How has faith made you shrink back rather than come out more into it? Why do we close ourselves up when we've seen what God can do? Because that's not the effect that was meant to be caused. The cause is not, 
because I've come to Jesus and been forgiven, the effect, I'm just going to sit in it and wait. That's not what the effect was. What have, his, what have his people always done? Whenever we hear stories of the great men and women of faith, or whenever we, because guess what? We're great men and women of faith too. Whenever we step out, we hear all these testimonies of what God did because that's what the effect was supposed to be. Because he's a great and high priest, come before him and know with certainty that he will not turn you away. If you have that thought in your heart, that goes off that says, maybe this faith just doesn't work for me because I'm not getting any better. Hold on. It takes time. It took an entire life for this young punk Jacob who used a rock for a pillow to return to that rock one day with all of his family with all that God had done, because God had answered the challenge, he kept Jacob fed, clothed, he had provided for his needs, he had kept his promises of giving him a large family that would continue to grow, and he brought him back to that land, made it his own, and that is when Jacob says, put away all these false things that distract you. That's not what we do anymore. We're setting up this altar right here that says this This is God, and this is where we will make our life. And what does this small family become? They become a large nation that time and time again, God does not turn away from them. Though they turn away from Him and their mistakes, He's always there to say, if you'll just return to me, you'll see I'm already here. He's not a God who is in the business of leaving. He's not a God who stands far away from you. He's not a God to point fingers. He's a God who says, be sure that I'm here and I can do it. I love when we sing that song, Our God is Able. I love it. It's a powerful song. What if your life said that? And that's the challenge I'm giving you this morning. To know that first off, when you come to God, if there is sin to be dealt with, repent. And what does he say? I'm faithful and just to forgive you, if you'll ask. And then, after you ask him for it, ask for something else. And keep asking him. Because he can do it. Hold unswervingly to that hope that you profess. Because it's hope you have, right? Isn't that what it is? You, you, you hope that because of what He's done, one day you will live for eternity with Him. He will make this earth and all the heavens new again because that's what He's in the... He makes things new. He's making you new every single day. Hold on to that. Don't swerve to the left or right or doubt or ask these questions. His word has said, he who promised is faithful. So next time you want to ask the question, how can I know for certain that he won't turn away from me. He promised you he wouldn't. He promised you that he would never, ever leave you. And even if you want to say to yourself, well, he should have, look at me. He says, look at my son. I promised you I'm not going to leave. when we read about the hands of God holding us, those hands have scars on them. These hands were crucified to hold you. You really think He's just going to drop you now? And 
And this is what we need to remind each other of. Well, I want to remind you of... Van, you can go ahead and come and get set. Because I want to, want to remind you of this last challenge I want to give you. Is first off, if you in any way don't feel that certainty from God, look to Jesus. Look at the hands that have scars. Look at the side that was pierced. The blood that was shed so you could be forgiven, so He could hold you. And know that He's faithful to do what He promised. And the second is, know that everyone in this room struggles sometimes to remember that He's faithful. Some of us could have had that week. Or we've had that month. We've had that year. Or maybe you've had that life. And you need somebody to say, remember, He's faithful. He loved you, and He loves you, and He'll never stop loving you. Remind each other of that. Be bold in reminding each other of that. So this morning, if you're in that place, or maybe, what would be bold that? Maybe you never trust Him to start with. Maybe you're going to try and make your own way. Maybe you're here because Sundays from 11 to 12, that's just what people in Alabama do. I invite you to first off remember what he was willing to do. I challenge you to challenge him like Jacob did. If he's really God, let me see it and he'll show you. Or maybe you're that one who's saying, you know, I loved him, I was close to him. And then life just got in the way. And I went over here, and then I went over there, and I tried to trust in this, and I tried to make my own way, and it's not working. How can I possibly go back? Maybe God won't take me back. He who promised is faithful. He'll take you back. He never left you. So I challenge you to return to Him this morning. Thank you.